Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to this special edition of APTN National News, where we're looking back on the year that was. Though it might be odd to say after living through two years of the same old COVID-19 stories, 2022 was for all intents and purposes a year for historic firsts in Quebec. Here's Lindsay Richardson with a look at what made headlines in 2022. Call it the little court case that could. It's a legal first. The Mohawk Mothers of Gunawage, a traditionalist matriarchal group, obtained an injunction against McGill University, convincing a judge to postpone groundbreaking at a former hospital site where they feel Indigenous children could be buried. I feel like we're closer to having our future generations heard, uh, our past generations heard, and whatever has happened to our children that... They have purpose. But this was not the only historic court victory of the year. Back in February, the Riviere Magpie, Muetesego Shibu to the Inu Nation, received legal personhood or permanent court ordered protection from hydro exploitation, a first ever for Canada. For me, it's always been like that, it's always been like that for all the nation. The nature is living. With the CAQ's re-election came talk of economic development, mainly construction of more hydro dams to ease strain on the province's system, which was good news for a community like Kitsisakik, who found out this year they'll finally be hooked up to the Hydro-Quebec power grid after years relying on expensive diesel generators. Quand je vais avoir ma première facture des testus, ça va me faire plaisir de le payer. Je vais prendre ma facture, je vais le faire laminé, là, puis le mettre dans mon mur. Il faut dire que 2000, ben, dans le fond, c'est, c'est une journée historique, ça. 2000, on est en 2022, le 2, 2 mai, puis on annonce, tu sais, pour les gens de la communauté qui, aux autres, ils disent, c'est enfin. On va les c'est fini, les but in 2022, APTN also spent time on ancestral Inu territory destroyed by generations of hydro development. Je sais pas à quel point vous êtes conscient que ce soir, on a marqué l'histoire. This year, however, the Inu Nation gained a representative in Quebec politics with the historic election of Catherine Champagne Jourdain, the first Indigenous woman to ever hold a seat at the National Assembly. Mais les choses vont changer pour moi, puis les choses, je l'espère, vont changer aussi grandement pour notre région. But development concerns this year weren't limited to water. Back in February, the Atikamekw of Manawan pushed back against logging in an ancestral maple grove. By November, an Anishinaabe-led report, months in the making, made a direct link between deforestation and declining moose numbers. This is a state of crisis now. There's, there's no way you can refute that. Meanwhile, Kebouac First Nation in Western Quebec pushed back on proposed rare earths mining on an ancestral settlement site, calling out the potential impacts of the CAQ's economic recovery efforts post-COVID. Anything between the, the air and the ground, I mean, it, it, it really is endless. Quebec's relations with Indigenous peoples may have been testy, but the Pope's apology and visit to Quebec City provided opportunity for healing. Nous avons les sacrements de ton fils. But a new bombshell report by Radio Canada revealed there are likely more deaths in Canada's residential schools than previously reported. In Quebec, the school with the most possible deaths is Fort George on the Cree nation of Chisassabee, where 12 children are unaccounted for. The community announced its intention to search the site back in June. Cree Grand Chief Mandy Galmasti says most of the work will happen next summer. It's a two-year project. I think they're going to be able to have some preliminary answers. And there's also local engagement where they're gathering people's stories. Moving forward, these are not the only children being sought. Last year, at least 21 were added to Quebec's list of children who went missing or died following a hospitalization off reserve up until 1989 for a new total of 110. Their families are seeking government assistance through Quebec's Babies Law, an access to information bill. But Quebec is ending the year facing off with Indigenous kids at the Supreme Court, arguing that Canada overstepped in creating Bill C-92, a law giving Indigenous communities the right to take over their own child welfare systems. A judgment is expected in the coming weeks. And for Indigenous leaders, the agenda for the new year is already set. I've said this to the Governor of Quebec a number of times. Uh, You had the opportunity to do things differently. Uh, but you have, you have chosen the other route. 
So will Quebec change its course in 2023? Well, you know the saying, only time will tell. But we'll be bringing you all that news as it happens. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. This year was a busy one for Alberta, highlighted by the visit by Pope Francis, which had some controversial moments as well. APTN's Chris Stewart looks back at the stories from that province. In January, the nonprofit Nasika Services announced intentions to purchase the government owned Trans Mountain Pipeline. A second group, Project Reconciliation, told APTN in March that their group is fully prepared to buy all of the pipeline. We are finance ready to purchase 100% of this pipeline on behalf of the 100% Indigenous ownership. In May, Roger and Anthony Bilodeau were convicted in the deaths of two Metis hunters. The deaths of Jacob Sanson and Maurice Cardinal made national headlines. The two hunters were shot by Anthony Bilodeau after a high-speed chase. The father and son left their bodies on a rural road. Roger Bilodeau was convicted of two counts of manslaughter and was sentenced to 10 years minus time served in August. His son, Anthony Bilodeau, was convicted of second-degree murder and manslaughter in Sansom and Cardinal's deaths. He will be sentenced in January. The family of Jacob Sansom and Maurice Cardinal told APTN that Jacob and Maurice died needlessly. He chased and followed two men down a public road he cut them off and he tried to run Jacob over and then turns around and claims self-defense. They just wanted to have a conversation while bringing a gun. What message does that tell our people? It tells our people that it's open season and that if you are non-Indigenous, it's okay to shoot, shovel, shut up. In July, Pope Francis visited the community of Muscochese and held services in Edmonton and Lake St. Anne. Thousands of people attended. With the Catholic Church's role in the residential school system, the visit was not universally applauded. On the Pope's first day, Chief Wilton Littlechild gifted him with the headdress, a move that gathered criticism. Littlechild told APTN that the decision of the gift was made by a committee. Apparently a lot of people are angry at me for doing that, but I don't tell them, where were you when the Prime Minister got a headdress? Where were you when the President of a company got a headdress? Where were you when others got headdresses? Why this one? So, it was a personal gesture of reconciliation, and I feel good about it. In August, APTN showed a glimpse of life at the small boy camp. The small boy community has lived in isolation for over 50 years. They celebrated their powwow and told of their fights to keep their land and protect their water, which is being threatened by industry. In November, Pro Gambler announced a lawsuit against the Miscordia Community Hospital and Covenant Health. Gambler says the hospital forced her to give birth to her daughter by herself and without any help. She says a nurse watched her deliver her baby and did nothing. Her daughter later died. Also in November, the Nietzsche Institute Center of Indigenous Learning was evicted. Again, the school trains counselors on addictions and treatments. In 2020, they were evicted from the main building at the Poundmakers Lodge Treatment Centers for expansion. Now, they've been evicted from their temporary accommodations in old trailers on the site. They told APTN that they have found a new location in Edmonton and will survive. That is a look at some of the top stories around Alberta in 2022. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Time for a quick break and then we'll turn our sights a little further north as we continue our look back at 2022. Welcome back to this special edition of APTN National News, where we're looking back on the year that was. Northern British Columbia had a wide range of stories in 2022. Indigenous land rights came up repeatedly. APTN's Lee Wilson looks back at some of those stories. We started the new year off with a tragic story in Northern British Columbia. A late December apartment fire in Prince Rupert left nearly 20 residents homeless in January. BC has been facing an affordable housing crisis, 
with cities like Prince Rupert struggling with a lack of rental units. Rhonda Bolton and Robin Russ narrowly escaped the fire. Been here three years trying to get places and we can't get a place because we don't have like a full-time job and we're just on social assistance or whatever. And it's like real hard to even hear anything. In February, we talked to North Battleford, Saskatchewan grandmother, Krista Fox, as she prepared to walk from Victoria to Nova Scotia to raise awareness for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. She first met with advocates and families along the Highway of Tears before she started her journey. Fox stated that on her journey, she wanted to share a message. This is a genocide. This is our missing and murdered Indigenous women, men, children, and this has to stop. One of our biggest stories was the ongoing conflict with the Coastal Gasling Pipeline. Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs remain opposed to the 670-kilometer pipeline running through their territory. Tension started to build again as the company prepared to pass the pipeline under the Wadzinkwa, or Maurice River. According to the CGL, 20 unknown assailants attacked their drill site at night, causing millions of dollars in damages to equipment and buildings. A CGL security guard identified as Trevor described the incident. You know, having somebody come, come at your window and they're trying to smash right here, right by my head with an axe, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty terrifying. Yeah. On Indigenous Day, the Clayley Today First Nation did not do a land acknowledgement. They did a land declaration. At a press conference, they declared they never ceded their territory around Prince George through treaty or war. And there will be no extraction of resources from their land without their free, prior and informed consent. Clayley Today are entering a new period of relationship building with the province of BC and the federal government of Canada. It is important that they know where the Laidlaytene First Nation stands on the issue of land ownership, title, and rights. Finally, this summer, the Niska sent a delegation to the National Museum of Scotland to get their totem pole back. In the 1920s, the Nishjao Memorial Pole was stolen by anthropologist Marius Barbeau with the help of federal Indian Affairs agents. Hereditary Chief Nishjao shared their belief that the totem pole is still alive. When they become fallen and on their own, that's when they're not alive anymore. But all these poles that were taken were never fallen on their own. So in other words, they're still alive. In December, the National Museum of Scotland agreed to give the totem pole back to the Niska. Dr. Amy Parent was part of the delegation that traveled to Scotland. I felt just really relieved when I heard the news to know that justice has prevailed for our ancestors, and in particular for our great-great-grandmother, Joanna Moody, as well as our fallen warrior, Dawid, and that we have an opportunity now to bring this pole home and the living spirit of our ancestors home back onto Nisco lands. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. There's been lots of highs and lows for news this year in the Yukon. Our White, House, White Horse Bureau has covered everything from a new First Nations school board to the discovery of a 30,000-year-old mammoth calf. Here's Sarah Connors with a recap of the Yukon's most memorable stories of 2022. Hey, oh. 2022 started off on a heartbreaking note. During the first week of January, four people died in the territory from illicit drug and opioid use. Three of the deaths were Karkross Tagish First Nations citizens. Communities across the territory held vigils to honour their memory. Later that month, Yukon Health Minister Tracy Ann McPhee declared a substance use health emergency in the territory. It is time to rally around our communities, our friends, our neighbours and our family members who need our support. The declaration does not grant the territorial government any additional power or privileges, but is a commitment to provide a coordinated response. The same month, we also brought you a story on the new Yukon First Nations School Board. After weeks of referendums, eight Yukon schools ultimately voted in favor of joining the board. 
just really excited, like just knowing that my daughter is going to be going to one of the schools. Now up and running, the board gives First Nations and communities greater control over education. It also aims to improve Indigenous students' educational outcomes. I think it's a long overdue step and it's time that First Nations communities had a real voice in how their children are educated and what programming happens at the school. Fast forward to this summer, where festival season was in full swing thanks to dropped COVID restrictions. In June, the Attica Festival in Whitehorse returned for the first time in two years. The annual week-long celebration showcased Indigenous arts and culture from across the circumpolar region. This year's festival featured a hand games demonstration and even performances by the Sami people. An indigenous group from northern Scandinavia. The spirit and the intention of why we have this festival every year is always about just bringing communities together, sharing stories, um, and really just this, just the, the heart and soul of, of us coming together. Attica wasn't the only event to get rave reviews this summer. Dreaming Roots is a stage performance based on the past, present and future of First Nations people in the territory. It weaved together works from 50 plus Yukon Indigenous artists and dance, music, storytelling and more. Its themes included the impacts of residential school, the relationship with salmon and Yukon's northern landscape. This is all, like, this work is new for them, and it's their creation, and it's traditional, it's new, it's contemporary, it's, like, you know, visionary. It really speaks to the climate of um, our Yukon society. This summer also hailed the discovery of an incredible find. When I looked at it, when I first looked at it, it was just amazing. It was, like, something I couldn't um, fathom. In June, Placer miners discovered the mummified body of a 30,000-year-old mammoth calf on Trondekwichin First Nations territory. Named Nunchuga, she is the most complete mummified mammoth found in North America. Towards the end of the year, First Nations consent was a topic of conversation for the fall sitting of the Legislative Assembly. So where we're coming from is uh, uh, in a position where where uh, we should have a say what happens out there in our sacred uh, territory. NDP leader Kate White was vocal in her party's fight to restore the First Nations Consent Clause in the Yukon Oil and Gas Act. The NDP's proposed bill would give power to First Nations without settled land claims, like the Ross River Dinner Council, the right to consent to oil and gas development in their territory. But the bill was ultimately voted down in the legislature. That's your 2022 Yukon Year in Review. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Thanks, Sarah. Coming up after the break, we'll look back on the year that was in Nunavut. Stick around. We'll get back to this special edition of APTN National News where we're taking a look back on the year that was. 2022 was a big year for Nunavut, a major mining decision, an infamous criminal released, and a high-profile visit from a religious leader. As our Kent Driscoll reports, there's never a dull day in Nunavut. Nunavumut are artists, the highest percentage of people who are artists in all of Canada. That's why it's no surprise that Inuit film had a big year in 2022. From Zach Kunuk taking us down a hole through animation, to these kids from Inukshuk High School in Iqaluit making a suicide prevention film. But one Nunavut movie changed the game this year. Slashback. Nyla Inukshuk's look at what happens when aliens try to invade Pengertung is groundbreaking for Inuit film. Four young Inuk girls have to fight off the invasion because their parents are at an all-community square dance. It's scary, it's funny, it's touching, and above all, what you see on film is what you see in the community it was filmed in. We were buying the material from the co-op with the fabric that they had there. The girls, and, and same with wardrobe as well. If they needed sneakers, we were getting them, the, the, the sneakers that they would get at the co-op. The bikes, 
<laughs> at one point there's a pile of bikes and I was a little worried. It's like, all the kids have the same bikes, but it also is true that in town, all the teenagers have the same bike and they just have to put their initials on it because that's the bike that's for sale at the co-op. So it's okay that all the kids have the same bike. 2022 also marked a year where one of Nunavut's most notorious sex criminals was released from prison. We reported exclusively that former Catholic priest Eric Dieger was released from prison. Dieger was convicted of 24 counts of sexual abuse in 2015 after a court process that drug on for years. The victims were all Inuit kids Dieger got access to from his role as a priest. He's currently living in a halfway house under restrictions and has to report to a probation officer. Arguably the biggest story of 2022 for Nunavumiut was the eventual decision to not allow the Baffin Land iron ore mine to double their production. After years of consultations, the Nunavut Impact Review Board decided not to let the mine expand the way they wanted to. The drama was in whether the federal cabinet would agree with the review board or veto the decision and allow the expansion. In the end, Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandell went along with the review board and the mine maintains their status quo. We get a lot of interesting visitors to Iqaluit. We're an airline hub and the gateway to the Eastern Arctic. This year, that list included the Pope himself. On tour in Canada to acknowledge the church's role in residential schools, the pontiff made Iqaluit one of his stops. According to the former mayor and MLA, Elizabeth Shutiapik, it was important. This is an international milestone where we're finally being acknowledged for that. And to me, why not come out and celebrate the survivors and, and the people who have survived, because it's intergenerational. And the bishop responsible for the Arctic had much the same sentiment. All of us are looking for something, some hope, joy, uh, and I guess the new, new things in life, because we are very often stuck uh, within ourselves. Memory, um, and it could be anything. The Pope ran late. He was meeting with residential school survivors. When he did hit the stage, he spoke in Spanish. Here's the interpretation. This only renewed in me the indignation and shame that I have felt for months. Today too, in this place, I want to tell you how very sorry I am and to ask for forgiveness for the evil perpetrated by not a few Catholics what will 2023 bring for Nunavut? Probably not another papal visit, but who knows? Nunavut is Canada's largest region, has the youngest and fastest growing population. Nunavut is a place where things can happen fast. Whatever does happen, we'll be bringing it to you right here. Kent Triscoll, ABTN National News. Halloween. Thanks, Kent. That's all the time we have for this special edition of APTN National News, where we took a look back at 2022, and it sure was a hectic year, but definitely looking forward to what 2023 brings. Of course, you can find more on any of these stories on our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Mioi ten li zor dilan. Good night.